This is a special clock made by Ahasuerus Roman Teal, probably within the first five years of the pendulum's existence. So it's a very early clock, but it's also got all sorts of interesting features which have been put on and then superseded. So whether it was going backwards and forwards to a customer or being developed um, within the Roman Teal factory, who knows? Anyway, it looks a bit unprepossessing for what it is and it is the most incredible complicated clock itself it's a musical clock and it's probably the first musical clock made in England uh, of any form and here it goes four o'clock so all in all this is a most fantastic little spring table clock made within the first five years of the development of the pendulum and yet it's a musical clock so if you'd bought a very very expensive beautiful mechanism and you brought your friends round you'd want to be able to show it off not wait till it came round till five o'clock so this is a magic you can take the lid off and inside there's a little lever, and if I pull it up, listen. Again. Really impress your friends, isn't it? You're beginning to need winding, isn't it? There we go. Wasn't that fun? So it's a fairly unprepossessing case. It has these Truscan columns, heads, capitals, and bases. Plain, um, architectural in form, but not in full detail. So it's, it's uh, starting to move away from the true architectural detail clocks with friezes and uh, all the, the detail on the, uh, on the top here. But even though it's unprepossessing, again, it's still got some interesting features. This is a spring clock, of course, but it's different to most spring clocks because the case itself is, has an opening door. It's hinged on this side, so you'd expect to see a keyhole here, uh, but it hasn't. The keyhole is hidden round the side here, and if I put the key in, the winding key, then I can open the door. You can see the spring for the latch which locks the front door closed and the little cam here so that if I put the key in and turn it it will lift the latch and I can then open the door. Can you see the latch moving up and down on the cam? There it is. Open the door and it's locked. With the door open you can then, like a long case hood, you can lift the whole of the hood off, leaving the backboard in place. 
So it's just like a sawn off <laughs> long case, uh, but with a spring clock inside it. The backboard is different again from the majority of clocks I've ever seen in that it is removable. And so the backboard will come out and just leave the, the whole of the clock sat on its seat board here. It's, it's like a miniature long case clock backboard, but it's not got the, the seat board attached to it. So now we've got the hood off and the, we can see what's happening. It's got a beautiful silver-faced, solid silver-faced chapter ring, and the adjustment for the pendulum um, the disc itself is silver as well. So it it's, was certainly made with no expense to be spared and with the musical movement it certainly must have cost a small fortune. Now, I would have thought something like a third of a million um, in the money at the time. And the quality of the casting of the spandrels again it just so shows Froman Thiel's mastery of doing a good job that the, the actual thickness of these casting pieces is so beautifully fine and then the whole thing has been chased to give this wonderful spandrel. And the hands are the lovely simple hands which uh, Froman Thiel specialised in. Just perfection in simplicity and yet the detail is just sets them off from being boring. Here we've got the A for Azurus, Fromentiel, Londini, Fake It. Azurus, Fromentiel of London, Made It. The A looks like a bit of an afterthought and I wonder if uh, um, John, his son, was also working on the clock with him and so when he had it engraved, he just called it Fromentiel, so he might have been included. And his dad thought, no, no, this is, this is my work, and put the, had the A added later. And there we go, there's the back of the clock. And it's very interesting because it's got vestigial remains of here is a roller box to suspend the pendulum on. But it's then been left out and this extension has been put up so that you've got a mechanism to adjust the rate of the pendulum from the front of the clock and the snail cam has a spring so that as the snail cam uh, reduces in diameter then the spring is pulled up and the clock goes faster whereas if you rotate it anti-clockwise so that the snail cam becomes lower then the the pendulum becomes longer and it runs slower. So from the front of the dial with the winding key I can adjust the height of the pendulum. You can see the snail cam coming round and the spring pressing up the collar on the moving member so that the spring then below shortens the pendulum or I can make the cam come round to its maximum, pushing the collar down to give the longest length of pendulum to slow the pendulum itself down. So this is the adjustment square on the other end of the cam. And if I put the winding key on, then you can see the scale underneath. So here is it at 20. If I move it to 30, I have no idea how many units that is or what it means, but if you were adjusting this every day for five years, I think you'd have a pretty good idea. The, our striking train and quarter trains are all set off here with the standard count wheel, so that it's, you can't repeat it, but um, here is the standard count wheel with the pump piece to make the mechanism either do the ting-tang for the quarters or the bong for the hours. So here we've got the locking lever which has just came, come in and stopped the mechanism after it's done the three quarters here. So this was one quarter, two quarter, three quarters and then 
coming here is a pin which there are three of them and so that it strikes on these pins, the, the three pins, trips this cross lever to trip the actual musical mechanism on the other side of the clock. So that you can actually see at the moment this pin is about to trip the mechanism and so as soon as the clock strikes, um, we've just got five minutes to wait now, and you'll see the mechanism trip off and hear the strike take place. In the movement you've got three trains and three barrels with uh, fusees. You've got the going train, you've got the hour and quarter train, and then you've got the musical train, and they're all separate. And the, obviously the musical train itself takes um, the most energy over here. So I'll show you the funny, interesting mechanism how the movement from the front is turned round the back so that you don't have any winding holes in the face of the dial. So you've got these wonderful crank mechanisms which convert the winding from the front to up to wind actually onto the uh, fusees themselves. So you've got the three winding mechanisms to transfer the motion from the front to the back and it's very interesting how it works. So this is the mechanism for the large musical side movement and I'm just turning it and you can see these levers that when they're in line then it doesn't know which way to go but you've always got the second lever coming round so that in each case it links and they're out of phase but isn't it a wonderful mechanism? So at this moment, this lever is exactly in line with the crank. And so that if I just had that one alone, if I tried to move it, it wouldn't know necessarily which way to go. But because we've got the, the second lever here, it's got the full right angle to push. And so the other one will go over top dead center and bring it round in the same way again. It's the only clock I know which has all these crank mechanisms, because as you can see, they're very complicated and must have cost a lot of money. But it enabled the, the clock not to have any holes in the dial, that's all. Because uh, most spring clocks are wound from the front with the holes through the dial. Up here, we've then got all the bells. And uh, there are, there's the hour bell at the back, the quarter bells, ting tang, and then you've got the whole set of the musical bells. It's quite a piece of work. But each of the smaller bells has two hammers, and the, it's sharp on the front one and an ordinary note on the back one so that you can get the, the full range of uh, sounds out of the, the ten bells.